Let's start from the perspective, the urban perspective, from the city for, as we talk about the townhouse. What kind of spatial situation were you confronted or faced with, with um, in Kingston when you embarked on the design? We were really kind of shocked and challenged by the poverty of the public space on Penryn Road. The day we visited to look at the site, the pavement was full, full, full of students, but no space. The people coming to the bus stop, the road was noisy, the whole stretch of the frontage of the site was filled with cars. There was a couple of trees. There was an old temporary building, which was not very beautiful, to put it mildly. So it felt like um, uh, a place needing, really needing transformation and really needing some generosity in terms of literally place to move in a, in a civilized kind of way along what is the public road and the bus route and the taxi route and all of those things. So uh, what struck us was noise, the, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the fact that the pavement was too small, all of those small things. That the, and it's Penryn Road, it has this kind of um, promontory position. It, it's the nose of the site faces back to Kingston, so it's, it's something you see as you come out of the old town. But then we were delighted to know that the Thames was close by and Hampton Court was close by even though you can't feel it on Penryn Road. So we felt, okay, the, the, the ground level <clears throat> has issues, excuse me. <clears throat> but we knew that as you move up, that the big horizon would be fantastic. So we felt that was a promise, that was a potential. What would be very clear is to have an image of what was there, which we looked at again recently you know, 150 car parking spaces on the outside, a very mediocre building, and to put what the university has achieved through the competition and through working, and what the, just those two images could be silently side by side, because the investment in belief in university, in the, the um, moving the cars, um, layering, uh, taking on the traffic on that busy, busy road, but layering it, giving the existing trees, which are, some of them are quite mature, and there was evergreen oak on one end in the north end, and a series of, of other fairly mature trees that were under pressure. But then giving them more, giving the planting uh, more life. So a linear park, I mean, I think we were struck by how the road engineers had won their battle and had taken over, and there was no quality. There was actually no quality. And the existing buildings had a door and a corridor and you know, did a job and do a job, but they didn't have something else which was about welcoming and saying something about celebrating what university can be. And we're, and we're, going, to, and we're going to be talking about all the ways in which you resolve this. I'd like, because for, for the beginning of this, I'd just like to go to this moment of the competition and the brief, which was initially, um, you know, basically finding space, creating an architecture for a public reference library, open to the public also, and a place of quiet learning, and a dance and performance center with all of the sound uh, acoustic demands of that, quite different with such contrasting spatial programs. And your answer to this was initially um, a typology that basically created a building for these two programs kind of in their own right. And then I'm interested in what happened next because I think that's really important and that was revelatory for us as, as, as a jury as well. Um, the client led, interestingly, by former architects, right? took on a whole different course. So perhaps you can talk about that, this, evolu this evolution of the merging of the two programs mm -hmm. and the complexity that that evolved from that as the brief developed for you. 
Well, what we find when we're doing competition is we try different options. And we were looking at the elemental thing, making a tower addressing Kingston, which would be the, say, the library and a horizontal building, which might be the dance. But then you find, as you go back to a brief, and the brief was really rich, it was actually like a kind of a, an imagined brief you would give to a group of students. And for us, that it was real. There, here were these people, and they were talking about these things which were not just about the space they required, but the kind of ethos. And they had um, uh, uh, an educational um, person uh, always with us right through um, negotiating this thing of the philosophy of education. They actually got an architect to help them to write the brief and to interpret their needs. And what we always find, um, Yvonne talks about a building suddenly becoming, becoming a creature and feeling comfortable. And we found that the, the vision didn't fit into the form, that we were struggling. And then when we, <clears throat> when we let that go and took a looser approach, the, the project started to settle. And the two, um, let's say, opposites started to contaminate or energize each other. And we became really excited about that because education is too compartmentalized. Our lives are too compartmentalized. We, we don't have the, the richness of overlap that traditionally, I think, happened in, in education. For instance, engineers used to be trained with architects and vice versa. Um, philosophers with, with doctors, you know, it, it was a, a different educational tradition. So that kind of overlap and um, uh, interlocking is, is hugely important. And it's why we use, we often go back to the plan of St. Gallen, which um, is a, mo a monastic settlement. You know, it's a, an amazing thing. But when you look at that plan, there's animals, there's stables, there's chapels, there's monks, there's workers, there's everything. And, and it's like a kind of microcosm of a city and a microcosm of a, of a community. And that's what the richness of city is and what the richness of education is and what the richness of social overlap is. So we just found that we had to find um, a form or a kind of infrastructure which would allow the uh, vision to flourish or to grow. But it's also about a belief in the power of section, that, that architecture is not a series of plans to satisfy a building kind of requirement. So it was a belief in the possibility of interlocking. And it's something that you often talk about, Shell, about abrasion, you know, that it was a crazy brief, you know, a library and dance. There's actually extremes of, of uh, of use. One is the body and, you know, really training in space and the other intellectual, which is kind of private and seminars and groups. So this was an architectural kind of chance to find uh, how would these how would these work together? It was a risk. It was a risky thing, actually, for the university. They had these two needs. It would have been a very different building if their needs were different. So this was this was about the human body kind of uh, possibly on display and the human mind. And the, so the mind and the body being in the same building. And uh, if you like, uh, remembering that both make us human. That's what's interesting for us, I suppose. So tell me, um, th I mean, this was an interweaving of intentions, an educational agenda that was pretty radical, and then you're interlocking and you're finding a structure for it. What surprised you actually about the educational agenda that was expressed in the process with uh, those responsible, but also with the jury to, you know, in this work of, e of letting the project evolve? We had finished uh, a number of buildings where there was lots of offices and separate departments that needed certain kinds of identity. And there was something incredibly liberating about the fact that everything in this building was to be open except the really noisy rooms. And that meant we could play with space uh, because doing the project in Toulouse, which we really enjoyed, and in Bocconi was 1,000 offices, and in, in Toulouse it was 300 offices, research offices, and here there's about six offices, and, and there's, there, then there's dance. And we started to think about the, 
the, the, the, the noisy rooms being like boulders in the ground and that the library could climb up over it and that that would be like a blanket of free space which climbed up over these solid noisy things and that then they could start to interlock and be interwoven. So it was that thing of, of, of the program also offering this potential to, to make open plan space, which is why we filled the site with the building. We just filled the site, 55 meters by 55 meters, which meant then that you're taking, the sky becomes really important, as well as the horizon. Uh, and that's, that's I think, um, we, we, felt, we felt it was very liberated. I suppose it was just the ethos of the ambition and the education and the fact that it was for students and not professors. We kind of liked that. The form, though, that you describe, the, mm -hmm. the fact that we were a, edged by a, a busy road, edged by existing buildings, edged by existing trees, and a very uh, two-story, two essentially, uh, existing houses to the to to the north so there was a there was a formal pressure on the whatever was going to be built there so we modified it not only interior in the interior is there a, a, if you like a spatial matrix but also the building was dropping down towards the residential to accommodate you know to to if you like uh, in terms of planning that it was respectful uh, to those living there and also that in terms of sound and light that they wouldn't be kind of polluted by this new that I mean if you live there you'd be worried that this new or uh, increased capacity um, educational building would be built close to you so the building was responding both to the physical context uh, of where it was as well as to the educational um, it, it's like a spatially it's very interesting it, it's like a kind of a water pump it's like as if it rises and drops, and that there's that you're held in different. <clears throat> excuse me, you're held in different volumes that have different spatial feelings and different light. And one of the things that's really important is that <clears throat> the connection to the existing campus faces the south, and the relationship out to Kingston faces essentially west. The rest are kind of quieter, and the fact that the sun moves around, the building becomes like a, a like a sundial that you are aware of the day. And there are things that not only context, but also the place on the earth and the time of day. So as a student, you know, you know, you know even by the physical sunshine that your lecture is at 12 o'clock or that you're some, you're, or that sun. There's a lovely feeling when we've been there for long periods of time and watching the building respond and then the changing character of the sun as it goes over towards Hampton Court to the west. There's something very beautiful of a building having this kind of um, uh, the, the the, the changing color and impact of the sun and the passing of time, the building has that kind of feeling, which we find very beautiful. I mean, your solution is, is um, architecturally, is, you know, you have these strong architectural elements and you basically create also an extension of learning spaces to the outside. So you solve the lack of public space with the building itself. So how, how, how did you create these double uses of, you know, the, of the exterior and the upper floors you know, and the staircase? How did you create that s sort of structurally? It's something we're passionate about, that the ordinary can be transformed. In the project in Toulouse, with the, the six uh, fire escapes acting as a kind of a container for the carved interior, so the, uh, taking the tradition of tr of Toulouse with its buttresses and its brick buildings of the container. In this case, the fire escapes, let's just take the outer crust, the fire escapes are transformed into not only being safety mechanisms, they're also protections from the sun angle in the, in the summertime, they're uh, landscape gardens, and they're also a threshold membrane to bring people in from the, from the outside. So there's this outer um, layer which is asked to do a number of things. And I think that that's true of architecture, that it needs, that it's not only one response, that it's not a functional response. It has symbolic uh, connotations as well. This kind of portico that's other things is also a statement of this being other than just the building. This, this membrane between the public zone and the interior says something else. Buildings do speak. I mean, 
we've used the phrase, you know, the, the silent buildings uh, have a silent language. They do communicate. Uh, there's a way that people respond to a building because it says something uh, emotionally and physically. You talk a lot about thresholds, also in relation to boundaries at pivotal points in the city landscape. Um, you've talked about the thoroughfare and the kind of urban situation that, that was difficult, that worked for, and you had to create a strong accent at, at, um, with the building. The program Inside invites the public across these thresholds. Perhaps you'd like to talk about these with examples of the spaces that you've created, this flow of the different spaces and the way that they're used on the different levels. Because that was striking to us, mm -hmm. the openness and this notion of where are these thresholds and how did you resolve these needs of the students and the public access. We'll come to details too, the staircase, we'll come to those details. Yeah, I, I, a bit like the way we spoke about the, the sound, that is layers of silence and layers of sound. Um, it's layers of publicness, let's say, where it's uh, it, it, this thing of porosity. And the, the fantastic thing about a colonnade or a loggia is that it's not a wall, but it is an enclosure. So you're making an enclosure with rhythm you're dealing daily with rhythm and not just surface. And rhythm is a fantastic thing because it's a, it's a musical thing and you're in this space which um, you could say, well, it's just a colonnade, but also it, it changes, it's section. So it's a, it's a three-dimensional thing. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not completely true to its uh, origin in terms of the traditional sense of a colonnade, which is a very classical uh, wonderful um, element. Uh, so it, it's that thing of, of gradually revealing, that thing of um, uh, gradually welcoming somebody. I suppose it's like the way we get to know each other. We gradually go past certain boundaries and then get to know a space or a project in a, in a deeper way. I'm just thinking though, because um, this thing of starting off with the sight and the noise and the difficulty of a, a road full of pollution and buses and things. And then we make this terrace which overlooks it, which doesn't really make sense. And people often say to us, especially in Dublin, when we try to make a colonnade or a loggia, you know, you're not in Italy. But we don't believe that those architectural elements are owned by a particular culture or climate, we think you can import things and use them in different ways. And we do have cloisters and colonnades in Ireland in the monastic um, settlement within the monastic tradition. But we also, in, in, in Kingston, we have an optimistic view that the road will not always be like that. Life is changing. You know, there, it won't be full of cars. And I remember reading a long time ago a wonderful essay by Jim Sterling comparing Villa Garsh with the Jaoul houses by Le Corbusier. And he talked about the Villa at Garsh somehow imagining a world that hadn't yet happened and that it was somehow out of sequence with its time. And, and that was making a certain point, but it stayed with us that, that sometimes you have to ignore the fact that it's noisy and polluted, this road, and still make a beautiful edge and know that in the future it will change and that students can sit facing west even if there are buses and that you just make a, a filter of, of climbing vines or honeysuckle or wisteria and that somehow even a small curtain of, of landscape makes you feel that you can inhabit uh, a space. So we were really pushing this thing of taking a hostile road and by, by setting back, engaging with the pavement, believing that this road will, in the future, become more a civilized space, uh, and, and creating a, a habitable edge that students can come onto, you know, that somehow it's an inside-out building. It's not about walls, it's inside-out for practical reasons of not filling a deep building with escape stairs, but everybody comes to the edge to be safe, but also to be happy and to enjoy the big horizon. And even when this building was on site, 
One of the things I was really struck by, Yvonne was talking about the path of the sun. But what I loved was that you were always looking out to a big horizon. And I think that's very important for a student or somebody involved in the stress and focus of, 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 of education and learning and, and, and all the hoops that students have to go through. That somehow you, it's like our eyes need, need the relaxation of, of the big horizon. I mean, we know physically now, working on computers, you need the horizon and the sky. So it's, these thresholds had a lot of these thoughts that you could come in the back door, you could come in the front door, you could come in a side door, that you could walk through, that you could come through the event space, which is sometimes closed for an acoustic reason, but that you can still bypass, that it's like a backstage door and a front of house and, you know, that it's, uh, it's like a square that you walk through. So that yeah, let, let's talk more about that. So the public is drawn, I mean, the, the building's open 24 seven, extraordinary. Uh, we hardly saw any security. <laughs> um, the public may enter at any point. Um, tell us about these major elements that became, become a, a central to, 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 the, to the building, to the townhouse. Uh, the staircase, you talked wonderfully about that yesterday too. I think that it's important to stress how liberated and liberating the clients themselves were. We were shocked by the fact that they didn't require the levels of security that you imagine is related to both a university building, a building in the 20th century, like when you go, 21st century, when you're going through univer or, uh, airports, when you're going through airports, you now have to you know, kind of declare all the things that you have, all the liquids, you know, there's a kind of a, a layering. If you think trying to get in and out of any country now, you have this kind of layering of uh, stripping you back to what is, you know, potentially dangerous. What really struck us at a human level was that Kingston University said, this building does not need security. I mean, that's an incredibly radical position for a university to take. So you have these radical uh, uh, investment in the future of these students uh, with the university. Then they, um, in, the, uh, in the understanding of the building, they really bought into the idea that the, the main public space would not be a black box that you kind of knocked on the door, peeped around and went in, you know, that, that this was, that the, the main space, the gathering space was also a generous space. And there's also sustainable, I think there's a wonderfully sustainable as aspect to the, uh, to the courtyard, even the naming of it, that it's not the, the so-and-so auditorium and you open the door and you're in this space, that this is a courtyard, a kind of a free space, that its neutrality allows you to bring in your, your lunch and sit on a, a, a formed bench and you are entitled to it. There's a wonderful sense, I think, in the building of uh, entitlement in the best sense of the word that you can arrive in if you're a taxi driver, like we've said it to taxi when we arrive on site, we've said it to taxi drivers, you know, you're welcome into this building, you can come in. And they're shocked by the fact that a university feels that, that it's about, uh, that, that they are privileged, if you like, to be a university, that the building communicates, tries to communicate this, the main space. I think what, I love watching, we have that image, you might have seen it yesterday, you know, there's a dancer kind of wrapped around a, uh, a, a concrete uh, structure and she's raising her elegant and, and beautiful youthful body in, in dance and the, so there's a relationship between the structure and the dancer and then there are people sitting and we were there recently and it's interesting various uh, students come to meet their friends and they sit in very particular excuse me particular positions within it and it would be interesting over time to map out what that actually means culturally what it means in terms of personality types. So the, there's an accommodation. What, what we love watching, we don't spend enough time sitting and watching people's in, people in the buildings, uh, in buildings themselves. But it is uh, interesting because architects are also sociologists. You're actually watching what impact does a building have on people's behavior. And we like the fact that in this building, the courtyard AKA that could have been the black box and kind of kept you out, flows out from itself to the foyer, flows out through the, uh, the colonnade, flows out onto the, onto the street. And I'd like to make a point about 
Yes, when Shell says that in the future, you know, that the traffic could be, you know, modified and more civilized. But in the meantime, we're very conscious of the person on the upper deck of one of those red buses as they go through, being able to see into it, that, that actually it's an archery that goes through. And I think that the layering, the layering that we've set up by revitalizing the trees, revitalizing the, the, the landscape and putting in the colonnade, it actually sets up these, these layers of protection. So even if the traffic doesn't change, that it still remains for many years to be an archery, that archery is about the view in as well as the protection from. So I mean, I was thinking yeah. more that they would be petrol free and quieter. Yeah, well, you know, and not right. polluting the earth. Mm, that's yeah. that's really mm. what I was thinking of. Yeah, because pedestrianized spaces are very often so dead. I mean, there will always be movement on that archery, but I suppose it's the noise and the pollution. And it is lovely to think about the person on the bus, which we did think about in Bocconi actually that the, the, the tram line is right beside the auditorium. So the, and, and it, the, the stone in Viale um, Bligny, the granite stone with the old tram was like a tornado going uh, through that street regularly. But we put the auditorium beside it because symbolically it needed to be uh, in the most public corner. And there was the feeling that um, when you were going home in the tram that you could see down into the foyer, which was five meters below the street. And we have actually fantastic photographs of people in the rain uh, looking in to seeing what's happening in the building. So it's that thing of connection with the city is very important, whether you're the stranger passing by or whether you're a user. There's a fantastic photograph of seemingly in the minus five in Bocconi, where there was, I think, a children's art exhibition or something, and the children were allowed in, but not all the parents. And you have all the parents up on the street level, pressed against the glass, you know, obviously filled with pride, pressing themselves from the street level to view down. So that ability of architecture to heighten in section, because section uh, allows you to be like in a theater, so you're up on an upper level. And I think what's uh, the, the theatre, the, the, the essence, I think, of the Kingston building is that it kind of dramatizes people's relationship with themselves. So you have a dancer practicing up on a ledge, you're down below does something else. So the awareness of another person, that maybe architecture's role is heightening both our independence and our collectivity somehow, that, that they can uh, happen in similar time and they're not intruding. And uh, we received a beautiful email recently from uh, um, uh, the authors, uh, the author of one of the authors of the um, uh, the theatre that Shelley referred to, The Half Moon. And one of the lovely ways that he described his observation, he was in Kingston University recently. He had a half an hour before he was a critic in the School of Architecture, and he spent time in the building. And he, uh, one of the points that he made, I thought was very beautiful, was that People had a sense of their own uh, activity and their, their privacy was not hindered by being exposed. And there's something interesting about that, that you don't have to have privacy by being locked away and separated. That you can claim territory like a clearing in the forest and you can have relationship. At the same time in, that build, in this building, it's a major acoustic challenge, right? Because what strikes you when you're going through the building, you talk about the, drama the dramatizing of, this, of, of people's use of the space. And actually, when, when you see the different ways in which the workspaces are used, um, it's remarkably low key and quiet. So how did you resolve these acoustic challenges? We realized that it was the I'm thinking of the ceiling, sorry. One, sorry, yeah. we, we realized that it was the key challenge, not just because of the dance studios, because they're a box within a box, and that's not a big deal, so to speak. But um, uh, it, it was engineered and monitored, and uh, every element uh, in the building works towards uh, controlling the acoustics, the ribbed precast concrete slab, help for starters. The light fittings are designed to include uh, acoustic absorption. 
all the walls are, uh, have acoustic absorption either between the concrete fins or between the timber fins. So it was a lot of work to actually reach the point of comfort that we wanted to reach. But I think it's really, it's something we've really learned. So many contemporary buildings are uncomfortable when they're full because we love exposed concrete floors, exposed concrete ceilings. And then everybody is uncomfortable because there's too much reverberance. I mean, we all speak about contemporary restaurants. They're too noisy. You can't have a conversation. Whereas the old Parisian bistro, full of velvet and curtains and carpets and all those things, you could have a civilized conversation. So I think sound is really important for that sense of calm and comfort. It would be very interesting, actually, over the next few years to map the acoustic, you know, like contours within the building, because it, the, there's also a fine line between something being too quiet and not being quiet. So there, there's a, there's a, it's interesting we're here with the traffic as it goes by, you know, the city life is full of sound. In fact, when it goes, there's an emptiness, there's a void. So it would be very interesting actually over time to map the, you know, how people choose places, not just volumetrically, but sound wise within, but it is a contoured, it's, it, I think there are maps that we can do of the building about its, uh, if you like, sound quality or sound uh, uh, thresholds at which it becomes either uncomfortable for you to study or you want to, I mean, some of the rooms that are really, really useful are the small uh, seminar rooms that are also places where students can book and whatever. So that there's also places where they can move and they can be in smaller subgroups themselves so they can claim little territories for themselves within the, uh, within the layout. And that leads me to the question of this kind of next level of educational spaces. I mean, you're becoming extremely known, you know, widely known now for, for dealing with spaces of education and learning and having these interlocking and uh, inter interacting spaces. In what sense would you say Kingston Townhouse, um, by creating this variety of workspaces, in, and perhaps give us a, a sense of the different types of workspaces, in what sense does it reach a, a next level for you in terms of uh, empathetic educational spaces that allow for this diversity of use? I think these carving in of landscape, like this south-facing upper outer room, which has uh, benches in among landscape as an outside space. It's just interesting that we're very interested in not only internal outdoor rooms, but external outdoor rooms so that you have choices of places to have conversation. I mean, Khan, Louis Kahn makes the point that the most interesting seminar room, I think, in a building is the cafe, you know, that, that also the two cafes, I mean, it's very interesting. There's a cafe on the street level and there's a cafe on the upper level. And it's also a place where people of different uh, uh, timetables, whatever, can meet and rendezvous, that then you have conversations. So it's, it's intermediate spaces. It's spaces where there are benches where you can sit down, making sure that students have uh, places where they can uh, reboot their, uh, their phones or their laptops. Um, it's also about having ledges, having choice, really, uh, because I'm sure people um, uh, each person has a different sense of where they, they absorb knowledge to because they're also studying. I mean, they're not just sitting around chatting to another. They're serious. Uh, one of the things that really strikes us is that they're also allowed to eat anywhere, which I find amazing. So they can bring, it's not like, you know, no food, no talking, no, that isn't there. And the point that Chell makes, which I think is important, is that it's kind of self-policed as a place. You know what I mean? It's not a, it's not a cafe. There isn't a kind of smell of chips as you go up through the building, or a kind of a curry sitting on somebody's desk. There's a sense that yes, you can do all those things, but there's a kind of an inherent um, respect for where they are that it isn't misused. Uh, the Idea Store in London by David Ajay really inspired us when that happened for partly for that reason because there's a market on the street level and there were external escalators which would take you up and through the library and you could take your coffee everywhere and and that kind of thing and it's a bit like Yvonne's comment about what do you need to feel unselfconscious and it isn't always a private room it's a space where you feel comfortable and there was a beautiful interpretation by 
Raphael Moneo of uh, Free Space when he was part of the Biennale that we created. And I can't remember it exactly, but it was something like that when the architecture becomes no longer um, present, let's say, in terms of the consciousness of the user, that it, it, it offers a sensorial freedom or a liberty. And that's when free space happens. I thought that description was brilliant. And there's something to do with with privacy as well, that, that if, if a student feels free to practice his or her dance in a space where there are other students sitting, having their lunch or whatever, you know, how, we, we don't know how, what the recipe for that is, but it's happened. So, and, and then if, if we can deal with danger and fear in cities, which is so present by saying, well, if this building is popular and full of people, it will be safe. Life isn't always that simple, but the fact that the university says the building will be safe when it's full of people. So if it works as a building, it will be safe. If it's empty and nobody wants to use it, it will be dangerous. But there are no dark corners, really, where you can be attacked here. You know, and, and it's just that faith again in in, and, and we saw it this morning at Laborda Housing, where the archway between the street and the park is left open. There's no gates. And that's an amazing gesture of belief in humanity. So are we too defensive uh, and too fearful? And if we treated each other with more dignity and respect and um, confidence, would people react and respond differently? I don't know the answer to that. But well, I think you certainly ha have an exemplary moment uh, in terms of educational buildings with the Kingston Townhouse because this, this lack of fear <laughs> and this kind of low-level security, I think it intuitively creates a situation in which the, both the students and the public feel dignified yeah. Yeah. by the space. Yeah. Well, can I add to that and say, it would be very interesting to think about the, uh, the awkward dancer practicing, being observed by somebody who is awkward in their discipline, and getting courage from being able to see somebody who can't do the dance steps yet, but through practice and through uh, instruction and through uh, encouragement, uh, that somehow they can see improvement. because. I think th there's something yesterday with that beautiful dancer on the roof. You know, you really see space claimed with the physical body. That maybe the, the juxtaposition of the craziness of, you know, dance and library together actually has a, a healing effect on the, the pressures, on in, the intellectualization of some subject matters. And that it might encourage students to, you know, I'm just thinking as you're asking the question that that, that maybe the... The, the fact that one is so physically and bodily awkward, like really awkward, I'm sure there's some students, when you see, uh, when you see a dancer that's, uh, you know, Diaghilev, you know, that somebody is extraordinary, you just know that they're like some creature from another planet. And then there must be dancers who need time to develop those muscles and must be the worst possible example of dancers. But that's, that contrast and being able to see it so visually and so physically is probably uh, intellectually helpful for other disciplines. We don't know, but it is an interesting thing to think about that by setting up these kind of awkwardness that you liberate someone or they can feel parallels in their own disciplines. And, and these interweaving of, of, of needs and spaces and, and, move, uh, and movement we haven't talked about one of the central elements, um, the staircase. Tell us about why that was such a prominent, that's such a prominent factor in the building. And I mean, it's probably um, in terms of engineering was quite, was maybe quite a challenge too, because of its status, its size and its. We, we did a medical school in the University of Limerick. And the policy of the university was to make the elevators not invisible, but not the first thing you meet because they wanted to encourage people to use the stairs. 
And we really learned from that building. And it's four stories, and everybody uses the stairs, and there's no problem. And it's good for health, but it's good for the social life of a building. Because the, the, the staircase is a social conduit, and it's a piece of theater. And uh, Yvonne, you talked, you get embarrassed a little sometimes about this comment that you made about that the Kingston is a great place to fall in love because you can see the person and you can follow where they're going. You know, that, that young people can find each other spatially uh, by virtue of being able to see who's coming and going. And everybody uses the staircase. And the elevators are there because it's important. If you have a disability, you need the elevator. But the staircase traditionally in architecture is it's a social event. and. Um, also, the way you make, we spend a lot of time using models and things of how you could negotiate six levels without feeling tired. And there's that thing of coming up, there's a landing and you can come onto a floor and then you can keep going and that you're always seeing where you're going. And when you think of Italian hill towns, I mean, we, we looked at Atrani recently and people, try, people climb 12 stories on a daily basis in a hill town in southern Italy uh, because it's beautiful. Now, they might get tired and if you're old and 85 and you're carrying a lot of shopping, it's probably not so great. On the other hand, um, it's something actually that um, the practice 6A in London speak about is that it's one of the failures of contemporary architecture that the elevator is used as the only way of negotiating tall buildings and that the staircase is so important as a, as a, as a civilizing device and as a, as a piece of social infrastructure. So we, we love staircases. We love walking on staircases. You know, there's the rhythm, there's the, the, um, the pace of the stair, there's the openness, the thing of feeling closed. It's, it's, it's a wonderful um, conduit. But we made it also as you came in the front door, that the staircase was there to pick you up, to bring you in, to actually welcome you. And also when it was on its own, when there's nobody walking on it, that it would be a lovely thing. It would be a, a piece of, of uh, or as we described, you know, a piece like a dancer itself. I think the, the, the social opportunity of staircase, one for your heart that you, you know, if you run up those stairs and you know, it's good for your pumping the blood around your body to keep you as healthy as possible. But also, it's a chance. It's about chance. You know, who do you meet on the stairs? Who do you? It's you become. Uh, you become a dancer just by walking up and down the stairs. You're a participant in this kind of theatre of a building, and it does, you know, ask the question. I mean, this we understand that this Kingston project is the first university building to win the the Mies Prize, and it's amazing because universities are incredibly democratic spaces of of education, you know, they hand on knowledge from one generation to the future. So we're delighted that a university uh, is, uh, is, is the winner this year as, a, as a, the kind of endorsement of the power of education. But that staircase is really the place where you continue a conversation as you move up, you uh, are observed as you go by, uh, you might see somebody you meant to have a conversation with. It's also a kind of a, the, uh, it, it's a slow food kind of uh, in interior. The other thing I think I'd like to say is that from the competition, I'm always, I'm always amazed at the power of the uh, imagination before something happens, positioned beside the reality and how close they are. I mean, architecture is an amazing discipline because you, as a group, find something, create something, imagine something, and then there's a whole process of that imaginative space becoming reality and how similar they are. It's such a powerful discipline to imagine something that doesn't exist, to make it into a reality, and then through a process of, of agreement and cost and construction, it becomes real. It's incredible. It's like a form of magic. I'm just reminded when we're speaking about the staircase, uh, Yvonne and I took a potential client to see Bocconi um, many years ago and we met with a number of the professors and our potential client asked uh, this professor was there anything that surprised him about the building and he said the staircase and he said the wonderful thing about the staircase 
I love the staircase. He said, the only thing is that when I'm coming down this staircase, I wish that Maria Callas would be with me with one of her big dresses that she wore in La Scala. I just wish she's with me, that then I would really walk down that staircase. And we thought that was one of the best descriptions of a staircase. So probably only an Italian would, would describe it like that. There's no doubt that with the dancers, it will be used, it will be implemented, just as the exterior uh, levels of the building have been used by the dance school, right? So um, we talked about the very intense investment in the acoustics. I was also struck, I think many of we were all struck by the sort of the use of actually very modest and low cost materials throughout the building. And I'm interested in, in, in how you resolve these issues of, you know, not just the specific budget issues, but how you, um, how you make noble <laughs> these low cost materials, but also, and also your notion of architecture stepping back. I think that impressed us very much when we talked, you talked about that. The precast concrete structure um, pushes concrete to its most efficient. It also then demands that uh, elements are integrated from the word go and working and talking to our project architects that that also when the contractors had uh, you know, deep uh, uh, if you like um, conversations with the suppliers and installers at an early stage that kind of sustainable reduction of materials that kind of integration of uh, of uh, all our acoustic requirements, all our service requirements, all those things had to be thought of in a very early stage. So we, in terms of uh, the materials, we have no basement, which was a big uh, uh, decision that we wouldn't carve into the earth and we wouldn't uh, uh, have an expensive element that would uh, use up uh, limited funds, if you like, that we would use um, we would stretch the structure. There's a beautiful drawing that was part of Shelley's um, presentation yesterday, which is like the tartan grid of the spatial requirements. I think that was also very important that we found a, a very direct relationship between the sizes of the rooms, the spans that they required, and push that to, the, to its limit. Then had the other layer, the, the outer layer, the, 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 the colonnade, becomes another way of using the, uh, the uh, precast concrete structure. So it takes on a kind of another symbolic, useful layering. So the, the issues of materials, I think it was, it's lean. But well, not we were worried. Lean. I think we were worried about using precast concrete. We'd never used it before. And so many precast concrete buildings feel very crude. And you've got lots of mastic, big mastic joints. and. Um, we had been used to using in situ concrete. So we had to really work at that to, to make the junctions, not like timber junctions, but we were looking at anything as varied as the, the, the Greek temple, the column, the, the beam, the junctions of column with beam. We we're also looking at Tarani, the way that Tarani, Tarani makes Casa del Fascio in particular. There's a beautiful relationship of this kind of classical elemental quality of literally column to beam to sec primary structure, secondary structure. And that's what those little three-dimensional sketches were um, made by Jared Carty in our office, uh, who, who is a real, real skill in getting into this kind of detail. And it was also to do with the, the colonnade, which is refined because that's a special aggregate to connect with the Portland stone uh, Surrey Town Hall to the more ordinary bog standard raw concrete um, structure within. Uh, so it was to do with the junctions actually and also the rhythm of the ribs whether they would be close and fat or far apart and you know um, taller and slimmer. So it, it wasn't easy for us and we were nervous about that. That's about the the structure. The other ways of absorbing um, uh, the sound absorption was a real challenge. Uh, and the, the quantity, we couldn't um, make a sound absorbent ceiling because the, the floor acts as the cooling device. 
because there are pipes embedded in the precast concrete floor, so that's the way the building is cooled. So we couldn't clad that in sound absorption, but we clad the, the light fittings with sound absorption uh, material. And then the walls, the, the, the actual, um, there's heraclits, which is like straw, which we like, and we didn't seen from 1960s buildings, and uh, we just used that. And then there's this other black absorbent uh, material, which I can't remember the name of, which we didn't like. So we used um, timber strips to fix that, so that to the walls, so that things were integrated in a very um, rudimentary way. But we knew that the the primary elements of the building, that was it. We had nothing else to work with. So we had to make each of these things make the architecture. I think the T-sections in the ceiling are actually crucial for the kind of counterpoint as well. So it's the major structure of the precast structure. Then there's the minor uh, layering of these, uh, doing a structural job. And as Shell says, that then integrated into them are they light fittings, the acoustic panels, the pieces. So it's about thinking about everything early on to be as neutral and as stepped back so that life can happen within that. I'm coming to my final question. I mean, uh, you say you're revisiting the building. Um, you've dealt with this challenge of a radical client um, really bringing in all the wishes and desires of those progressive thinkers in the dance school, the librarians, the lack of security. Uh, what's actually been the bigger picture result so far um, of this mutual agenda, yours of creating these empathetic spaces of interaction and interweaving um, and the Kingston University? Well, we love the fact that their policy their educational policy going forward actually has taken on the name of the townhouse. It's the townhouse policy. And what we feel wonderful about that is that, that the impact of the architectural integration has become synonymous with policy making for the future, that it's become embedded in an educational idea. That means that architecture is playing a role. It's not just, you know, that's a project, that's finished, let's move on to the next project. They want it as a sample that you can stand in that building. And this is what is meant by X, Y, and Z, that you stand in it. And that's one of the things that we're interested in, in terms of what is architecture and how can architecture be felt by non-architects that within the architectural community, we can discuss within very rarefied words what we try to convey. But in the end, architecture has to speak voicelessly without architects defending it. It has to be the thing in itself. So what is wonderful for us is to know that their policy, educational policy, has now taken on the name of the building. So that the building is actually, this creature that, that has been created by all the people involved, is now a, a voice at the table of education. So that is a real, uh, uh, that in itself is an achievement. I think also that we're kindred spirits, the client and ourselves. We were actually, yes, it was a challenge to live up to their dream or their vision. But when we say we were amazed by the brief, it, it was like as if things we'd always talked about or often talked about were being presented to us as an opportunity, not something that we would have to to work at, to achieve, that, that we could really see that, um, that there was a real vision for education here, which was different to many of the other um, propositions that had been made or that we had dealt with. So we were, we, we were on the same wavelength and, and that helps because if you have to form new ground, common ground between a resistant client and a progressive architect, or maybe a resistant architect and a progressive client, because very often architects don't live up to the promise or the potential of a, of a client. And we've seen that. We've seen clients who really wanted something wonderful and the architect couldn't deliver it. I hope that's not said about us, but you know, we, we, we do feel a responsibility to rise to the occasion when we're given the opportunity. 
I think that also describes the, the, the planting of the early seeds, the educational psychologists, the building up their brief, their experience as educators. Like we're, we, we are involved in education and we do a lot of educational buildings, but in the end, each university is unique. And the people involved, I mean, yeah. making a project is also the, um, how do you describe it, the look of having certain key individuals with, uh, with ambitions and understandings and that they can communicate it to architects. I think that that's important as well, that there's an ability within the various disciplines to voice that discipline and for it to be heard. So I think the communication goes backwards and forwards between client, their advisors, uh, 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 within the architectural profession, being able to hear what is dreamt of or what is not dreamt of yet. I think there is a whole world of uh, exchange of potential ideas. That's the wonderful creativity. That it's the before the design. It's actually uh, something that has no form and no shape is wanted. And that that process between the discipline of imagination and the discipline of needing, especially in education spaces, comes together. We hadn't mentioned the educational psychologist, and she was fantastic. And she mediated all the, I would say, hundreds of meetings that we had. And one of the things she always said is that nobody had ownership of this building, no one department, because some were more maybe muscular than others. And she just kept that territory and I think that's what leads to that sense of entitlement. You don't feel the heavy hand of any um, uh, individual department, that it was to be a house and a home for all. And, and there were moments when some people were quite strong and wanting this, that and the other, and she would say, no, it's not yours. It's not only yours. You have to share this space. It's a bit like the discussion this morning in La Borda about how a community can live together and what are the rules of respect and negotiation that happen. Well, it's interesting what Shell has said is that, that architecture is in fact built philosophy. You know, that, that as architects, the, the discipline is to try and understand the need, but also what is the, the future philosophical position of that place. And it's incredibly nebulous. Uh, uh, f there are forces of voices of imaginative things or imagined things or not imagined. And then the process to try and find a container for that thing that's, that doesn't exist. It's an amazing, uh, but you need people with insight at various points. And as you say, that educational psychologist was you know, key. Other people were key at certain points to keep it alive, for something to survive. It needs the voice of uh, a wisdom at certain moments in its, uh, in its creation. Thank you so much. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Francesca. Uh,